A man chooses, a slave obeys. Welcome to the Ethics and Video Games podcast, where we explore issues at the intersection of ethics and video games. What follows is a series of graphic, interactive scenes that we can't show you. What can we do to get more ethical gaming communities? Louis Sparrow recently presented a really interesting paper where she and her team interviewed uh, game designers to see how they saw the problem and the challenges they faced to overcome it. It was uh, super interesting, so we invited her to the show to talk about it. Uh, Lucy, welcome to the show. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you for having me. All right. Uh, Lucy Sparrow is a PhD researcher at the University of Melbourne, Australia. You're our second Melbourneian, uh, second person from, from Melbourne. Um, her research examines the ethics of multiplayer digital gameplay and design. Uh, Lucy works as an academic editor and has held research and teaching positions in ethics and game designs at universities across Hong Kong and Australia. You can find her on Twitter at, uh, at Lucy Am, A.M. Sparrow. All right, Lucy, uh, let's start with the problem. Toxicity is a huge problem in gaming. Um, we've known that for a while now. And that can take a lot of different forms. It can stem from, you know, abuse and harassment of other players to sort of more milder forms of trolling or griefing and all that kind of stuff. Um, But, and, you know, one of the things that comes to mind when we think about why people are like that in games in particular is the question of anonymity, right? So people are anonymous, so they sort of let their darker sides come out, so to speak. But... We, you know, we know from something like Facebook that people are, can be pretty nasty to one another, even when they're not anonymous, right? right. So there's something else going on there. Um, some might say it's the lack of physical distance. We, we can't see, uh, sorry, the, the physical distance that we have. So we can't see the reactions of people. We don't sense another person's presence. So they kind of get dehumanized. Um, when it comes to games, there's perhaps those factors on top of the fact that a lot of the ways that games can be designed um, are competitive in certain in certain in a certain sense, which can lead to a lot of frustration. Um, particularly, you know, if you're playing with strangers online in a team game like Overwatch, it's incredibly frustrating to lose. And so, toxicity can kind of it snowballs. You know, it's this mm-hmm. kind of contagious thing where. Once one person is toxic, other people feel like being toxic in response to that. And they feel justified in being toxic in response because it's kind of like they're getting justice for what happened to them. And then it kind of gets normalized. Um, So then you have a culture of toxicity. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And when you have a culture of something, it's very complex and it's not, you know, it's kind of hard to say, oh, well, people are toxic. Let's just solve it. It's it's integrated into so many elements of the ways that players interact and what they value about playing as well. You, you talk about the, the the competitive games, but even in the, the sort of semi-cooperative games like uh, like MMOs, there's this level of, of, of toxicity that can happen too, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess some people I've spoke to might argue, some game designers I've spoke to might argue there's still a level of competitiveness, you know, you're kind of trying to rank up, you're trying to level up and just that kind of environment itself might inspire some people, not everyone to, to kind of get a little bit um, frustrated and angry and stuff, but it's not just that and why people are like that way. You know, it's probably a, a mix of a whole different factors come together, you know. Right. I wonder if if any of your other any, any of the other game designers you've spoken to have talked about the sort of fantasy of especially in in it, MMOs where a lot of this stuff like we've we've been in the MMO space a, sort of longer in some ways than we've been in this competitive space except for sports games, right? But in the sort of fantasy MMO, there's a a sort of holy grail of game design which is you can Go into this world and just do anything. And so, which means if you can do anything, you can can do things that are also unethical. Right. You can be an asshole, right? That's part of the fun of the game. That's part of the fantasy. Right. It's part of the role play. (laughs) Right. Right. Um, Interestingly, when I speak to players, I hear that a lot. They think, well, it's just a game. It's, It's this fantasy space. You know, I can do whatever I want. 
Um, but for the game developers I've spoken to, I think they they rarely seem to hold that view, actually. They don't oh. think that their games are spaces where people can do whatever they want. And I think that that probably stems from the fact that they're dealing constantly with players trying to find loopholes in their game and mess with the game in so many ways that it's like oh, already sure. on their minds, you know, to to think about how to control or manage players in some way. Right, right. Yeah. And of course, you know, whenever we have, you know, some players that think that, uh, you know, it's just a game and toxicity is part of the culture and it's okay to insult everybody because everyone does it. Of course, we also have some people that uh, feel the brunt of that. I'd like to actually get a little bit more into that if we can. Like, like since we're sort of in the def definition of the problem phase, like why, like, like how big of a problem is that and why is that a problem? Everybody who plays a game at some point, no matter who they are, will experience toxicity at some point. I would be very surprised to meet someone who's played multiplayer online games and not experienced right. it. But of course, um, particular groups, um, particularly certain minority groups, will experience a, a lot more of this harassment and targeted harassment than others. So women, you know, LGBTQ community, mm -hmm. uh, people of color and so on. The, these are the groups that often get a lot more targeted by this kind of harassment and toxicity, for sure. So so I wanted to ask, right, in your research, essentially, you're talking to game developers and you're talking about this problem, right? Mm -hmm. And you said, essentially, they came up with five, you, you arrived at essentially five problems that the game designers identified. So uh, let's, at least five problems as to why this is so hard to, to fix, right? So let's talk, let's talk about these one by one, right? So the first one you said is ethics competes with functionality in the design process. What do you mean by that? Well, what's, what's the issue there? Of course, for any game designer, and I'm sure you, you know this yourselves, um, making sure that a game works as it's intended is pretty fundamental to you know getting your game out there. If you're going to have players and people who are happy playing your game, it's got to work for them, right? So understandably, functionality is a really, really core and important element of game design. And it often takes precedence. Um, what that means is that if ethics, if ethical considerations for a game are not integrated into this process alongside functionality, and often ethics kind of gets relegated, you know, to a level below, um, then there can arise this kind of competition between ethical considerations and functionality considerations, at least according to the people that I spoke to. So if you leave you know, a lot of these considerations about how your players are going to actually interact with one another to the end, um, once your game is working and everything, it can become harder and harder to introduce mechanics or techniques or whatever to help that, to, to create a more positive environment without interfering with functionality mechanics, essentially. So, so basically what you're suggesting is that, is that um, people are coming up with with function like oh let's let's make it so that people can talk to one another without right. first thinking about like well wait a minute what are they going to say right and exactly how could this be how could this be abused how could this be misused maybe we shouldn't add this function in so completely un unrestrained and once you've done it then it's hard to go back and players right. can kind of respond you know if you suddenly take it away or say actually we're not going to have in game chat anymore that's going to piss a lot of people off in many cases because players get very attached and feel a lot of ownership over the games that they play because they're also their communities, right? In a sense. And I'm right. assuming the, the smaller the developer is, the smaller your budget is, the more, you know, you're thinking, am I going to spend it thinking about this ethics issue or just having the basic functionality so my game, you know, will, will work? Well, um, and, I, and I argue from, the, from that point of view that you need to do that before you do the programming work because it's much cheaper to spend yeah. that time thinking about the ethics than having a programmer program something and then find out that you don't actually want it in your game. So so, so front load that stuff, folks. All right. So let, let's go to the second one. Uh, notions of right and wrong uh, of player behavior are sometimes uh, unclear. Right? So in, in what way? I mean, we talk all the time about toxicity and harassment. Isn't that obvious? I mean, yes. So... There are certain forms of toxicity that are very obviously unacceptable, particularly on the targeted harassment and abuse front, right? Um, and I, I don't think there's many people in the world who would suggest that, that that's acceptable. The 
among some player groups, probably. <laughs> but there are certain fo lighter forms of toxicity that are really common in games um, that people kind of understand in different ways. So something like trash talk, for instance, is often talked about as there's this kind of curious line between when is it trash talk and when does it become actually just abusive or harassing or just right. very unpleasant. Um, even something like trolling, for some people, that can be a really amusing and fun way of adding something to the game, depending on what kind of trolling is occurring. Same with griefing someone in a game. Sometimes people really value the ability for players to grief each other. Even if they themselves get griefed, it's like, well, you know, this is adding something unexpected and, and surprising to the game. So I actually kind of like the fact that people are allowed to do this. And that's before we get to things like, you know, uh, you know, what is racist? What is sexist? Right. I mean, it's interesting. You left kind of those big categories that are kind of obvious out. Right. I think I think the examples you gave are actually much better because we normally kind of uh, think, oh, yeah, for, I always think griefing is bad. But. Obviously, it's not always bad, or maybe not everything counts as griefing. Yeah, the, one of my players and one of the players I interviewed and one of the developers I interviewed both mentioned an experience in World of Warcraft where a player became such a fabled sort of element of this game where they would basically camp in a certain area and they were very powerful in the game. They were very good at the game and they would just kill anyone who came past, even if they're low level, no matter what they were, right? Mm -hmm. And this kind of player was frustrating for a lot of people. And typically that could be seen as a kind of griefy thing to do. Um, but mm -hmm. at the same time, a lot of people came to see this person as like almost part of the game. They were like this unexpected, like a, a literal troll, <laughs> you know, sort of <laughs> guarding the bridge. And that, and that's kind of fun for some people. And that and that's sort of infamy versus fame, right? I mean, infamy is sometimes just as good as fame, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I'm thinking from the designer perspective, right? How are you supposed to design uh, so that you're keeping in right behavior but leaving out wrong behavior when we can't draw a bright line between right and wrong? Yeah, and and that's something that the the people I spoke to grappled with all the time, and and they said mm -hmm. it sometimes felt really uncomfortable to kind of say no, you can't do this in this context, but then actually maybe you can in this context, and it becomes it feels almost very arbitrary sometimes to them without, if, especially if they don't have these sort of fundamental guidelines to begin with, right? right. And especially if they're not thinking about like you know this is the way my friends and I play when we're together, why not? Like I'm and now I'm speaking more about like the kind of, you know, trash talking and that sort of thing. These are the way my friends and I play. Now I've got friends online. I'm just going to play the same way with them. And yeah. what's wrong? I don't understand. Why is this wrong? Right. Uh, especially if you come from uh, traditional gaming communities that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that would be much more prone to do this, especially as compared to, to new gamers. I, I'm yeah. thinking here of kind of two different issues because context is such an interesting problem. So again, first of all, you have things like, you know, uh, you know, a code that bans hate speech, right? Um, but then, you know, the same thing could be said in different context, yeah. right? Uh, Absolutely. Where the same words could be said, and it, in one context it's hate speech, in another context it's not hate speech, and I, I think it could be extremely difficult to figure out uh, what 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 that stuff is. Yeah, my my so so strangely enough, just yesterday my sister in law was banned from Twitter for a day uh, for the phrase um, "playing in traffic" or "play in traffic." Oh. Because it's frequently used to tell people to go die, right? Go play in traffic. Oh. Never uh, heard it. <laughs> but she yeah. was literally talking about hmm. somebody whose house was too close to the road and how that seemed like a really good way to teach your kids not to play in traffic. Wow. wow. Okay. All so, right. Yeah. yeah. So, the, so the auto the auto filter caught her and banned her for a day. Right. Yeah. And notice, right, if, if, if your algorithms can't do this, yeah. right, then you got people doing this. Right. And people are doing this with, uh, you know, their own subjective uh, lenses, right, as they're trying to balance this. And maybe you can try to normalize their judgments by having meetings among the monitors, et cetera, uh, and kind of get their, you know, intersubjective standards 
in line with what the company sees are the intersubjective standards, but the players might have very different standards and players are not an amorphous group. God, this is so hard. Right. Yeah, <laughs> not, not to say, you know, nothing to say about how, whether it's ethical to subject someone, an employee to, you know, an eight hour day of just watching other people be horrible to one another. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, there's, yes. there's been lots of talk about how the Facebook moderators are going through all kinds of all kind of trauma and PTSD from just stuff that people say and post on Facebook. Yeah. And I would think and, gaming would be a lot more toxic than Facebook would be my guess. Um, yeah. I mean, you know. the, the people I spoke to working in game development, especially community managers who sometimes do take on that kind of human moderation role in a sense, mm -hmm. um, do get a lot of abuse. Yeah. Tons and yeah. tons of abuse. Right. So that's so that itself is a really big problem, right? If if human beings are the solution, then if you're gonna put people on the front line like this and to get abused, God, that's that sounds like a tough solution too. All right, let, let's go to the third one. Um I'm keeping us on track. Uh all right. So the third one is ethical design decisions come with risk to reputation, revenue, safety, and well-being. So I'm assuming here is you're trying to design ethically, but that's going to come with risk for you in other ways. Why? Yes. Yeah. So especially for smaller companies, I would say there are a lot of risks involved. Um, so one person I spoke to said that, for instance, um, being transparent about the decisions they make and the ethics and the ethical decisions there that are in the discussions that are going on in their company. Um, if you make that public, it, transparency is great. But you know, if you're in a tenuous position with a divided community and a very online community, that can hit your reputation. If if you say something that that a segment of your community doesn't agree with or takes offense to, that can be really, really difficult for you. Um, and of course, that can translate into a loss of revenue as well. Um, sorry. I think we've talked before about how frustrating it is that uh, some companies, I think maybe Sony or Nintendo, you know, make decisions with zero transparency. And how much you then, you know, why did they, let's say, make this change, censor this thing, right? We want, uh, we want some reasoning for and they're trying to do something that they think is right. But yeah. the lack of transparency is frustrating at the same time, I can see how transparency would also create these problems. Yeah, and yeah. It, it prevents people from being able to speak freely because if they feel like they're not on the popular side of this opinion, then it's going to bite them in the ass, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot of fear there, I think, um, mm -hmm. a lot of concern, particularly because gaming communities are very online communities and, you know, things online can snowball very quickly. Right. Um, there, there's fear there. All right. God, so far, this is looking like a really, really, really big problem. All right. Um, next one. Industry professionals can be unprepared and unsupported in making governing decisions. Yeah. So most of the developers I spoke to, they got into games because they love games. You know, games mm -hmm. bring meaning, they bring fun. Um, they're, they're amazing ways of connecting to ideas and other people. Um, but a lot of them in dealing with multiplayer games or with gaming communities found out that it's, a lot of it is <laughs> like governing. It's a, it's a governance position in a sense. Oh yeah, um, I, keep, I tell my students that I hope that some of them end up in policy making. Yes. Yeah, and policy making in, for game worlds, this whole idea of you've got a world, the world has an economy, the world has politics, the world has a you know, yeah. society with different, uh, you know, uh, different subcultures and norms and thinking right. about and it again, as a as world we, is a good model. As we reach for that holy grail of, of, of creating a game where you can just go in and do anything like a, a virtual world then that becomes even more and more more important to like, oh, wait a minute, we need to actually have government in this world and have some way of like explaining what's the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. And and, and yet, you know, all the wisdom of the ages, right? The 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 the, the easiest thing, right? You got a you got a community, someone transgresses uh what you decide, you know, the community is, you, you know, you put them in jail. You, you know, cut off an arm. You know, right. you execute them, right? <laughs> Whatever the punishments are, right? Uh, I can block their IP till they get a new one. Really? What can I really do? Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. And that, that seems to 
you know, take a lot of so much of our system is kind of based on the idea that we have the ability to enforce or that we have systems that can give laws and rules legitimacy. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think in video games, you get problems on, on both both of these fronts. Yeah. One of my participants also said, who was a community manager, said, I am amazed that this is not a voted in position. Like, I don't, I don't know how I got here. I don't know why I wasn't voted into this, but I am managing so many people. It is so difficult. Right. Um, and yet, talking about this stuff, it, there, there's not a lot of support for it. And almost no training whatsoever for for yeah. this type of the work that they're doing, right? Exactly. No you, you training. Know, I, I'm really surprised by this because it seems to me that by now, this would be not an incredibly uncommon situation for games to be in, right? And that you have all these companies who are all dealing with the same problem. Um, why aren't they, why, why aren't there uh, people whose job is to train? Or is this a matter of there might be expertise to train, but again, we're talking about ethics compete with functionality. Is this a matter of uh, spending the money on this versus other things? I mean, what, what do you think, yeah, Andy? I, I, th I think that's exactly it. And I think that nobody has nobody has popped out in, as a leader for this and shown that it's actually valuable to the bottom line. Because nobody has and nobody is, right? Nobody's Nobody wants to take the risk that it doesn't make any difference to the bottom line. They could spend mm. all this money, train all these, get these people trained up, and it won't actually make their 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 product more successful yes that that is such an important point and it's one it's something that one of the people i spoke to as well mentioned that look if you don't have the research if you don't have all these studies to show the ceos of the company or whatever that hey fighting toxicity and all this stuff and paying attention to ethics is actually going to make you more money in the long run then they're just not like it's it's not in their interest they're businesses right they're corporations so that's so, right so I'm thinking of, uh, let's take like League of Legends or something, right? Uh, a game that is famous for its toxicity, right? You would think, I'm um, on the one hand, I w you know, I want to say, look, I mean, you want to think about your brand, right? Um, you know, you, you, you want to think about uh, if we're famous for toxicity and we've taken all these steps, you know, it would show that uh, we're listening to our players. It would show that, uh, we, you know, we care uh, about our players, that uh, we're not just, uh, you know, the greedy corporation that, that wants your money. But, you know, millions of people play League of Legends. And is that really going to make a difference? Is that really something that it, it how do you know if the number of people who drove away from League of Legends or it's kept away from League of Legends is going to be more than the number of people that, uh, uh, you know, um uh, really are, are going to play regardless. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned League of Legends because um, that company in particular is probably one of the more outspoken companies, gaming companies, in trying to combat toxicity because they recognize it's a problem in their game. Mm -hmm. um, and usually gaming companies can be very opaque about their own internal research and like what works for them and what doesn't. And again, because it's a competitive kind of industry, right? Um, so they, they have released some kind of, you know, talks and so on, like at the game developers conference about how they deal with this stuff, but you know, it, it's often very tailored to specific circumstances or a bit vague. I, oh, I will mention though, also of interest is something that has formed recently called the fair play Alliance. Yeah. And ethicalgames.org as well. And these kinds of coalitions of gaming companies, these efforts to kind of say, hey, we want to talk about ethics in games. We want to make games less toxic. Um, let's share the research that we actually have. And I think a lot more needs to be done because it's a fairly new initiative. But mm -hmm. I think it's great that it's, even if it's a bit late, <laughs> that these things are kind of coming to fruition. Yeah, I mean, it just takes a while, right? Um, okay. Yeah, it's interesting, right? In under in other industries, and even though you know other industries are competitive, right? Best practices for stuff like this uh, get shared pretty often. It's interesting if this is the kind of yeah. But think about how long it took for that first best practice to show up in an industry. Like like med you know, your medical ethics is a big deal now, but how long were, were there doctors before there were medical ethicists? Uh, sure. Though you know, um, you know business ethics in the 70s barely existed right you know, business, business ethics is a part of every business school you know at the, at this point right 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 and but there have been businessmen for hundreds of years 
Right, right. <laughs> but, in, but in other words, you know, professional ethics has become much more normalized. Yes. Right. And these are companies, right? So these are corporation business ethics that applies to them. But you're right. I mean, every industry takes it, you know, it takes a while to yeah. incorporate, you know, bringing the specialties, even, uh, you know, a shout out to uh, Jose Zagal and, uh, and T. Nguyen, uh, the two other people who, uh, who teach uh, a class uh, on ethics and video games. Right. I mean, you know, if there's anybody else listening that teaches a class on ethics and video games somewhere, please let let us know. Yeah. Uh, but again, notice how how rare that that is at this point. Right. Mm -hmm. And how can you expect people in the industry who have never been educated on this in any kind of organized way? Right. To 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 know about it. Right. Especially going back to the, the point about all these community managers. You know, there's thousands and thousands of these community managers working right now, none of which. Or, you know, how many of these people have had any sort of ethical training or even had any sort of psychology training uh, to deal with with the emotions that they're that they're dealing with day to day? I would love actually to see if there's anybody that trains any of these people and get them on the show. Oh, yeah. Uh, that that would be super, super interesting. Oh, that would be great. OK, uh, let's let's get to the last one. And the last one is, you know, uh, you're saying that game designers say, look. Ultimately, this goal of just getting rid of toxicity, that's just like it's an unfeasible goal. You just it's just unrealistic. You can't you can't do it. Yeah. Something that came a lot came up a lot was, you know, they talk about the kinds of things that you can do that might work. And then it, it all, always came back to this. But in the end, people are people. They will always find a way to mess with your game and mess with each other. They will always do it. And this was at times sort of tied to quite misanthropic views, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is human nature. People are just like this. What can we do? This is human. Um, but, you know, it was also at a difficult time during the COVID-19 pandemic and, you know, Black Lives Matter movement and stuff like that. So I think those kinds of emotions were heightened. Um, yeah. But it, it certainly also does point to, you know, this sense that it's just not feasible in the end. They can take some, they can make some efforts, but it's not totally their responsibility because there needs to be some kind of other movement or force in the world to kind of help shape better digital citizens, better players, you know, help them right. be more ethically aware on a personal level. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we can look at professional sports and, you know, they have, they have very strict rules about professionalism, right. And, and the kinds of things they can do and say, and, and, and yet there's still, there's still problems, right. You know, every year there's somebody who does something and, you know, and, and it's and, you know, the league, of course, either does something about it or doesn't do anything about it. And that becomes a a, a, a bone of contention in and of itself. Right. Or have they done enough or they do this? And so it's a constant thing. Right. And, and this and this idea that uh, it's the game company's responsibility to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Right. I can right. see if you're the game designer. And they're like, okay, you got to solve this problem. How can I alone? It, it, it seems like such a daunting, ridiculous problem. How can I change, you know, human behavior, uh, you know, b by myself? At the same time, you know, uh, part of me wants to say that I, I feel like this is, on, on the face of it, obviously true. Obviously, you're never going to be able to completely get rid of uh, unethical behavior in games. I mean, ever, right? But... Or anywhere especially else. If you, especially if you can mm -hmm. never quite define what is ethical behavior. Yes. So, <laughs> right. especially you know. then. Right. Yeah. And especially if you're not trained. And especially, right? Right. Uh, right. If you have unclear notions of what, you know, is right and wrong. And, you know, and, and if ethics hasn't gone in from the design process from the beginning. Right. And I can see how that could be. Uh, an exasperation. You're, you're just like, oh God, it's just, just is, it's pointless. We just can't do it. At the same time, it just seems really obvious that while technically being true, uh, there's tons of spaces that you could make morally better. You can't get, you can't make the world perfect, but you right. know that doesn't stop you from being able to make it better. Yes, and even yeah, substantially absolutely. better. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's that's what's kind of sad about it is that I think that. A lot of people in game development realize that and they do make efforts to make it better, but it's mm -hmm. just the, it's just tiring. <laughs> it's exhausting, <laughs> you know, to just right. keep trying. And it seems like these waves of players who are abusing you or, you know, aren't getting anything good out of it. It's just exhausting. And it, it really, it, 
it really makes people wonder if what they're doing matters or makes a difference, you know? And it, and it's, and as far as a design problem, it's also a much slower design problem than other design problems to fix because mm. other design problems we can iterate on, you know, within the same game, within the same development process. So if you have a, you know, you have a, a, a level design problem or whatever, you can just iterate on that level design problem within the course of, you know, a handful of, of, of play tests or whatever, and you can, you can work it through. But one of these things is because you have to think about these things from the get-go, as you mentioned before, like this, this has to be designed in from the beginning. If it doesn't work, then you have to try again with the next game, which might be four years from now right, before the right. next game. I mean, some of these game games have four-year development processes. So how, how, how long until you get a, a your chance to iterate on this idea and try to make it a little bit better? Now, yeah, we can do that if we, if we can work as a community then we can make the, we can work on each other's problem you know right. and, and work on each yes. other's processes and that that make, makes us like that me- needs that we need to sort of start publishing things like the academic world does and like here's what i'm going to try in this game to make the, the 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 online community less toxic after this is over let's you know, when i get it out let's make sure that let's see if it works and then what we can learn from that and go on you, you know t- and t- to me this this has to involve some people who develop expertise specifically in this in these sorts of problems. Right. Right. And, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, it seems to me that there are budding people in the gaming world. Right. That are kind of uh, developing some expertise on these. Yeah. Although and, it's interesting, though, because while the game design, the game design world is sort of splintering into different specialties. You know, mm-hmm. you have combat designers, you have level designers, you have, you have, uh, you know, systems designers or monetization designers. I don't, I can't think of anybody who's like a community designer. I haven't heard anybody talk about themselves being a community designer or a, maybe that's a specialty that we need to, we need to create. One, one person that does come to mind is a community manager. I think she's actually working with Among Us right now of the game. Um, called Victoria Tran. And she has written quite a few blog posts about what it means to create a community for a game, Mm -hmm. um, how to make a game feel like, how to make the game community feel like home um, and and how to kind of nurture people in this kind of, you know, um, much more kind and warm way, making people feel welcome. And I think she has some, some really good insights. I love it. Yeah, that's exactly the kind of things that, right, over time you want some expertise that can be shared. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, still, uh, you call this problem a, a, a wicked problem, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, can you explain what a wicked problem is? Yeah, so the idea of a wicked problem, I think it first kind of emerged in, I think it was the 70s. Um, it kind of applies to problems often linked to policy and planning um, that are so complex that it's hard to know where it starts and where it ends. So you don't know what the aim, the ultimate aim is. You don't know what the ultimate solution is. And yet there are people in positions of responsibility who are responsible for the consequences of any decisions that are made in relation to this problem. So sometimes, you know, these days it's said that something like climate change is a wicked problem. Something like Mm -hmm. dealing with the pandemic is a wicked problem. Very complex and hard to solve. Great. Let's solve it. Uh, yeah, what, yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Why uh, haven't have, we done it? <laughs> having, well, having said that, right? I, I know you. I know your team didn't come up with specific solutions, but you, you did. Uh, you, you do have some suggestions here, right? About kind of uh, directions, at least for for us to be looking at. So, what did you guys uh, come up with for uh, for directions here? Or should, should I should I give you each one and let you talk about that? Uh, I can I can just go through sure. them. I mean, we've covered go. so many of them already. So Great. the first one again is this foresight and planning to integrate ethics into the beginning of the process. Don't leave it till the last minute. Um, Supporting community management, you know, I think we need to look really seriously into training, into support, into better pay as well, because they're notoriously underpaid for the kind of work that they do. Um, Better education in that regard as well. And then there is this idea of thinking about how you can give players agency over forcing them to communicate in some way. So, you know, allowing players to communicate in a game can be great, fosters community, friendships, and so on, but it can also provide avenues for toxicity. So um, mm-hmm. 
you want to really think about what kind of communication you can have. And do you want to give people more choice over their communication? So a lot of games already do that by allowing you to mute, block people, and so on. But making sure that those kinds of systems are in place, giving players the choice of who they want to interact with and when um, is, is important. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Nintendo's general uh, solution for this is you can't interact with anybody that you don't know personally. So in order to interact with you know, somebody on Animal Crossing, you have to know their name and you have to get a friend code from them through some other channel. Yeah, that's true. Though it's interesting, right? So they're limiting my agency by not allowing me the option of getting to meet more people. Right. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's interesting, right? They're protecting me, right? And it's Nintendo, right? So they're, you know, yeah. I mean, that's... That's part of their brand and that's part of what they want to do. But it is interesting that if we're talking about, you know, uh, looking for agency, mm -hmm. right? Looking for agency means uh, giving me the choice. A, a lot of sure. games, I think, uh, have done away, some games have done away with the need to type to each other or even use voice chat. And they just use the chat wheels, you know, right. where oh. so you can just mm -hmm. use preset kind of um voice lines and this was something that my participants referred to a lot as being a, a good kind of new solution but you know we know from games like hearthstone that people manage to still <laughs> use chat wheels in a way that is offensive and bothersome how do you use chat wheels in a way that is offensive and bothersome i've, I've always thought that we're so so limiting though i i get i mean i get the i get the point you know, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, you're you're having some sort of uh, ability to communicate that takes out the ability to, uh, I thought, harass each other. Yeah. Right. How and can it, you harass and, each other? And anyway? at some point, you have to draw a line between harassment and annoyance. Right. That's right? true. And and you know, I can annoy you with a chat wheel very easily. Mm. But can I harass you with it very easily? That's harder to. To, to discern certainly mm -hmm. like and then there are things where the phrases become meaningful within the community in a way that are different mm -hmm. than what and somebody outside the community might understand them to be so you know th these you know community can can assign meaning to things that were otherwise previously meaningless right right that's right. true yeah i mean it would be something like in hearthstone for, you know it might be in you might have a voice line that says well done or good game and it's used when you make a mistake in a game and you've clearly lost it's just maybe not harassing <laughs> i mean depending on how often it's done <laughs> but um it, it is extremely annoying right okay um yeah. um okay so what about the next the next one is we're unpacking ethical values I'm, I'm super interested to to hear what uh what you have in mind there i think Game companies who are, you know, especially bigger game companies who are aware that they need to kind of show some kind of social responsibility, throw around a lot of ethical values. Um, they say, you know, we uphold accountability, we uphold diversity, inclusivity, sportsmanship, mm. um, integrity, and the, it, all these words are thrown out. And it, it's like, okay, let's just take a step back and, f and think about what these actually mean and how they are actually translated into the game itself so you know integrity means an adherence to moral principles right but like what so moral, principle? moral principle <laughs> yeah what moral principle yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> so, so using these words sometimes like it's said in games and also in the wider tech industry and in anywhere really is this kind of ethics washing like this use this kind of shallow use of these terms that doesn't really mean anything. My, my wife complains all the time about her company doing this, oh. that her company has all these like core values that are, and she's like, they're bullshit. No one understands what they mean. Mm -hmm. uh, they just use it to make themselves feel good about themselves. Um, and, you know, there are ways to unpack some of these, but uh, it's interesting also it seems to me that you have this on kind of two levels. One is for the company itself, mm. right? And then you're kind of like, these are values that are considered guiding principles for the company and you expound on them and you can do a bunch of, uh, you know, you can do a bunch of, of exercises, workshops where, you know, uh, you think about them as a community, you kind of get a vision of what, of, of what you want. Um, and this can potentially trickle down, but, None of that can be seen in the game 
if, you know, I mean, they can be used in thinking about how to design the game. But then I think you also need to unpack, you know, again, if you say things like, please refrain from toxicity or, you know, please refrain from, you know, from hate speech, um, right, or harassment, right? To me, there seems to be a big, a big problem there. On the one hand, these words have a certain vagueness to them, if mm-hmm. not, if not ambiguity, mm-hmm. right? Um, and on the other hand, it's also how do you teach these things to a community that's there to play, right? right. And unless it's implicitly done, unless it's done, you know, by community ambassadors whose jobs are some to do this, and you know, we're going to talk about this in another show, Lucy. Because I want you back to talk about about <laughs> that kind of idea, but you know, I I, I think it's you know, um, you know, Andy. Remember when we talked about that that one game uh, where we suggested maybe uh, in the introduction, an intro, um, but part of your introduction to the game before you can play the game, you need to kind of uh, uh, oh, get yeah. some sort of introduction to the values of uh, of the game. And right. this was a particular game that. Uh, had to do with some touchy subjects, mm. right? But the idea was that they wanted to make sure that everybody played the game um, in an ethical way. Particularly, they didn't want a bunch of people being Nazis in the game, right? Which, yeah, right, right. Very specifically, right? very specifically. So, so they wanted to make sure that so they had basically this thing that you had to read through before you could even jump in, right? Uh, or or wow. something, right? Yeah. Read through, right? Or watch something. I mean, we we suggested something like that, and notice. For most games, that seems hard, <laughs> you know. Yeah. What right. you know? Who's who's going to go through that? That's not what people buy a game for, right? Right. In this sense, in this case, they had a very, very specific game with a niche market, right? Yeah. Right, with a niche audience, right? But if there's a way to kind of do that, again, if you're playing uh, League of Legends and they're like, "We're inclusive," and they never communicate that to players, and they don't have a mechanism to communicate to players, yeah. Um, right. You know, and it seems to me it's a it's a good time to start thinking about what kind of mechanisms would do that. How how you do that? Yeah. And then and then you've got to make sure that those those values actually permeate all the way through the games, right? Because otherwise it'll just be like, well, you say that, but here are all the games that that right. allow me to do the things that you say I'm not allowed to do. So, and that, it, it can it can happen on like different levels as well. Like if if a company says, oh, we're accessible and inclusive, and they maybe they build in some. Uh, game modes that assist people with visual impairments, right? That is great. But at the same time, if their communities are still toxic and discriminatory discriminatory against people with visual impairments, then, I mean, you know. Right. Right. So, I mean, look, there's there's a, a problem here ab- about integrity, right? About whether companies essentially act according to their own values. But there's also, t- to me, this kind of like, this is kind of the starting point. The starting point is kind of, uh, or at least one of the key starting points, as, as I see it, is uh, figuring out how to at least have starting points of communicating values to a community like this. Mm. And it seems that uh, we're not at the point yet where you can even, you know, see how we can see how well stuff like this works. Yeah. I, I think we're at the point of maybe just figuring out starting points and then. Mm-hmm over time get better and better and better at creating good communities agreed yeah um, um yeah okay all of a sudden i'm like i want to think of some ways to do this like, yeah i you know, know. <laughs> you, you, you know it's it just off the top of my head you know um you know i if if you if you attend my community discussion you know i will give you a skin or an upgrade right you know just yeah. like just like you'll watch videos uh to make me money maybe i can also let you you know um, you know, do other things or watch other things or do anything that shows that you're willing to be if you've gone through the, the community training program. I, th- I think I think a, a great approach as well would be to encourage people not only to undergo training because sometimes people can go through it but not actually pay any attention. I mean, that's right. just and, always- and the right, right. training that has to be designed to be to be good and and not like our usual corporate training. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That, that yeah, we've all had to that look at. Everybody, right? Yeah. Right. I'm, <laughs> but again, but also, I'm talking about starting points, yeah. right? Yes. So again, right. I mean, all of these things would be rough in the beginning. All of these things, yes. you know, 
would be things that you kind of figure out as you kind of learn that you learn how to kind of integrate with the game. I would think over time as much as you can, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that there's probably a lot more fun ways of doing, I don't know, community pro social training. Yeah. Again, you know, in in a game versus, you know, you know, we, we teach, we teach our players to do all kinds of things. We teach players how to do, fairly complicated tasks in our in our games we should be able to and intrinsically right we do it while the game is playing while while they're having fun doing stuff we're tre- we're teaching them how to do stuff right um i don't see why we can't also teach them how to be better players well there are some efforts that you know encourage or reward players by for instance um acting as participating in a voting system like league of legends used to have Mm -hmm. and i think dota kind of has now Mm -hmm. um where you you know you get rewards by looking over looking over uh videos of of toxic potentially cheating players or toxic players and then making and deciding and you can kind of be like a community leader in that way yeah um and it putting players in that position of being responsible for their community i think could also have a good effect, but again, it's, yeah, it's pretty early days, I think. And there's there's <laughs> right. tons of games that have guild systems and have you know player organized groupings where they can be asked to like self govern. Yeah, you know, like just self govern, right. and the leaders of the groups are are can be held responsible for the for the misdeeds of the people in it. Yeah. So so it seems to me that there's a lot of places. Yeah, here's my kind of over you, and I feel naive here because you know I'm not involved in uh in uh, online multiplayer games um but it seems to me that there's a a lot of places you could start and b that this is going to take a while <laughs> oh yeah well, you know and it's going to be and it's going to be hard right but uh but you know hopefully with effort something like this you know could happen uh yeah. let's let's get to our to our last one adaptability yep so yeah. technology changes so quickly Communities and their values change so quickly that I think when we're talking about what kind of ethical guidelines or whatever that we need for games, um, we need we need them to be adaptable. We need developers to also be adaptable, to be open to tweaking and adjusting as time goes on. When new issues arise that weren't expected, they need to be sort of you know adjusted to regular discussions, that kind of thing. Of course, bottom lines are important. And I think that bottom lines probably can be established to some extent. Um, you know, it, it don't you don't necessarily want to go into kind of moral relativist situation, <laughs> but like to head into this more of a, a yeah, an agile ethics um, and understanding that these things are going to be a constant process by which you need to adapt. Yeah, and I think that that we we talked about that a little bit in the, in when we talked about how how quickly it is that we can iterate. If we, yes. we can iterate much faster as a community than we can individually. Yeah, yeah you know, it, it's interesting. I, I think of, uh, you know, any corporation that manages communities uh, has responsibility for responsibilities for those communities. I mean, you know, I mean, we don't let Facebook off the hook. Why would we let Riot off the hook? Yeah. Right. Um, you know, to, to, to me, the idea that, uh, again, you know, I'm, you're t- I'm, I'm someone who like, you know, taught professional ethics for, you know, uh, for, for, for a while who worked, worked in a business school doing ethics workshops. So for me, the idea that you need to convince a company to look beyond its bottom line just seems so archaic at this point. Right. I mean, this, <laughs> this is, this is stuff that, you know, again, at least other industries, have internalized, you know, quite a bit the idea that you, of course, you have responsibilities to your customers, and that's what's going on here, right? I mean, you have customers, and you're you're responsible for them. Of course, it's not easy in this case. It's particularly hard, right, to be to be responsible, right, or to achieve maybe not to be responsible, but at least to solve the problem of being perfectly responsible. Again, however, we we kind of talk about this, yeah, right. I, th- I think an interesting point as well, though, is that because for gaming, for, for a lot of people, gaming is a huge part of their life and it's a huge part of the way they interact with people. It's not simply like, oh, I drop into work or I use this product. It's it's their whole life. So 
Mm. Governing these people is governing players is kind of a an even bigger task, I think, in some ways, an even mm. more consequential task. And and then there are questions like, do we want a corporation, a business to have that much responsibility and control over what players can do, given that it's a huge part of their lives. That's like, we know from looking at something like Facebook, letting a, a company decide what's right and what's wrong isn't necessarily always the best, <laughs> the best move, right? right? So, you, so you're talking now about, about legislation right. and, and, you know, politics and, and, and getting actual lawmakers involved. Or, or maybe the corollary of that, which would be support. Uh, support from the government for best practices, yeah. support from the government for research, support mm -hmm. from the government for training, yes. right? If, if all these things are really hard to get and you want healthy communities and you're talking about a population and we're, we're pre-metaverse you know, pre here, right? But you're talking mm -hmm. about population that is going to spend uh, a lot of time and a lot of their lives. Does the government not have the responsibility to participate again participate doesn't necessarily mean control though maybe there right. are points where it should be controlling but here we got this huge problem and you know companies usually don't tackle huge problems alone right, uh, right. the government governments do become involved maybe government can become involved in some way to help yeah that's yeah great. i think that's a great i think that's a great point mm. what we don't want to have happen is have another comics code authority i mean there's the comics code authority of 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 you know the 19 50s through the 1980s was crushing to the comic book industry until it was abolished is is the the anti-pattern we want to avoid right again to, to, to me um, i i i would be thinking that's the last thing you want to do yeah you know or for sure. or or it would be a point of final desperation or you would have like you know little things that you would require but but I'm thinking more of the support, the incentive, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like, or even like tax incentives. Hey, you know, right? If you, you know, hire someone whose position is to train community managers on this, or if you, you know, we'll give you a tax break, right? Or right. we will, we will start a government research whose purpose is to help all these companies manage these worlds. That's that. That's what I have in mind. Right, or government funding for for you know coursework in community management and and community design yeah all right that would so, be amazing huge problem potential avenues you know ahead right we can we can we can move forward on this all right um lucy uh, sparrow thank you so much for joining us uh, you can find her at uh, at lucy am sparrow on twitter um great podcast good podcast guys gp gp yes thank you so much miss sparrow no thank you so much and gp all right, play nice, everybody.